I think Monterey represents the holy grail to car enthusiasts. And it doesn't matter which mark you follow or you love. And they're incredibly well maintained. They're presented better than they were when they were rolling out of their factories, whatever year they were made. Ron pushes his 356s beyond what anybody would believe could be done. He, he really is an extremely skillful driver. Everyone in the world wants to race their cars at Monterey and Ron's, Ron's got these funny little 356s, you know, and somehow he gets them on the agenda and over he goes. He's got a car which some Americans believe is the fastest 356 Porsche in the world. Monterey, for me and most other people in the world in historic racing is one of the top two places you want to take your car, to display it, to race it, and it's where anyone who has a, a passion for historic race cars wants to be. It's a uh, motor race where you just can't rock up. You, you've got to be invited. Uh, you've got to have a car that meets the very strict criteria. I always uh, tell people, you know, if you want to see some great cars from down under, take a look at what Ron and his guys are doing in Australia because um, I really have always felt that, that the way he builds them, the little details, the little touches, you know, he really gets it. He doesn't just get the racing side, but he gets the true spirit of 356 Outlaws and what these little Porsches are all about. Getting the car accepted was an incredible feat. Getting the car there is another feat, and then making sure that Ron himself goes. Getting him there is the final piece of the puzzle after all of those other dramas. Ron runs two different cars in the States, the grey car and the yellow car. Now, the old mantra of as it was, so it shall be applies in terms of historic racing east coast to west coast. The east coast cars are more highly developed than the west coast cars, so Ron has, and it's part of his passion, it's part of his determination to be absolutely at the sharp end. He has a separate car for the east coast events to the west coast events. Any contact is not supposed to be happening. Well, if there's any contact, you're supposed to talk to the officials. If there's continuing contact, then uh, the officials will talk to you. So it's supposed to stay clean. We race as hard as we possibly can, but uh, you're not supposed to hit somebody. Now the reputation of the, uh, of the East Coast races is that the guys there drive a lot harder than they do on the West Coast. That's probably because the organisers let them. It's not because they don't want to drive that pass hard or forcefully in, in, in the West Coast. But over there in the East, they don't take any prisoners. Uh, my name is Vic Spearman, so I work on Porsche 356s in my backyard. It's a big backyard. I used to be a mechanical engineer, but then I, uh, I got bored with that. I was working on Porsches in, the, in my spare time, and I just decided to do it full time with whatever came in the door.
My name is Robert Heap, and I'm an interventional radiologist who specializes primarily in complex endovascular procedures. I think the things that I like best about vintage racing, um, first and foremost, it's competitive, it's fun, the cars are, are great to drive, um, but it's really the people. It's really brought me into contact with just some amazing people um, who I would never have met before. Uh, people like Ron, people like uh, Vic and Barbara Skirmitz. He just got me. Oh, oh a lap, a lap, lap and a half. A lap and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that right? He was in front of me. And I, <laughs> and I looked in the... Finally, I got a good run down the back straight. And I said, yeah, he picked me. I could have blocked him, but I wouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I would have tried the outside to do a crossover. <laughs> After going up into turn one. I first met Ron uh, at Watkins Glen last September at the SVRA uh, event there. Um, it was interesting, you know, when we met, um, at first, Ron seemed kind of quiet, um, a little bit to himself, but always, always busy, always doing something, just a, a man who really didn't seem like he was comfortable sitting still. Um, but once I started talking to him and getting to know him a little bit, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of very interesting things about Ron. He's um, hardworking, he's very generous. He would absolutely, quite literally, give you the shirt off his back. Put it up, take the tie rod off. I'm sure it has a bow in it, which toes it out. What's going on, Ron? We're going to try and get it ready for the next race. We're going to get the um, front end pulled out now, change the tie rod, because that's bent. Uh, when I've got here to turn the steering so that the wheel isn't lined up with the steering wheel now and it doesn't turn properly, so we'll pull it apart and we'll get it ready for the next event, which is in another two hours, so we've got enough time. Got heaps of time. Now you guys race really close together. Is yeah. that because you know and trust each other, or do you race close with anybody? We race close with anybody that we trust. Now, there are some people we don't trust, and <laughs> we try to give them more room than, than usual. Is it momentum racing? Yes. It's Explain not. momentum racing. Momentum racing, no, a Corvette is not a momentum machine or a big V8. You chug it through the corners, you straighten it out, and you punch it, and light up the tires, and oh boy, you're a real hero. Point and shoot. Point, point and shoot, point and shoot racing. Shoot. A 356 and the Porsche 356 and a lot of other little cars, most little cars, are momentum cars. You have to keep your speed up. If you slow down too much, it takes you a while to get that speed back up again. If you slide a car in a corner, scrub off speed, you have to build that speed back up again. It doesn't come instantly. All right, helmets, bring them out. Show us what you got. <laughs> Ron is a self-taught airbrush artist. This is Ron's helmet that he's uh, worn, I think, ever since we met him. Yeah, I first um, bought this one over when I came over with Vic, we done it for it. And as soon as Vic saw it, he thought I was a poser. Now he wanted one done the same, you know? I didn't, man. I always had a plain old beat up white helmet. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bob, Bob actually rang me up and said, can you do a helmet for him? And I said, yeah, no problem. So, so Barbara that... gave uh, Ron some specifications. She wanted the American flag on one side, and me being Latvian, the Latvian flag on the other side. Now Ron knows how patriotic I am, and he added the burning twin towers out back. Don't forget. Get that? Mm -hmm. And you get emotional when you talk about that. I told you. <laughs> I came to this country at the age of five with my widowed mother from war torn Europe. And this country has given me everything I have, especially the freedom to do what I do.
vintage racing. It's a way to go out and have fun and have a good time. In vintage, if I say, mm, you know, let's have a beer, we'll fix it, you know, fix it when we get home. I can do that. There are no points involved, there's no championship involved. In vintage, every event stands on its own. So every event is a happening, if you want to call it that. Uh, when I started with the vintage cars, everybody helps each other out. If they've got a problem, they tell you how you can fix your problem. It just doesn't happen in the, in the higher levels, you know. That's what I like about vintage racing. They're flying the flag. They're flying the Porsche flag. Uh, and they're flying the flag for automotive enthusiasts. It's a celebration of a can-do attitude, um, fun, the way things used to be, the old world of motorsport. The really wonderful thing about uh, Ron is the detail that he puts into the presentation of his vehicles. Not just his race cars, it's in everything that Ron does, if you have a look at the uniform he's wearing, if you have a look at the way that his crew's fitted out, uh, I think he must have had a German mother. And everything that Ron does is, is meticulous and um, you know it extends through all aspects of his business and probably the best showcase of Ron's business is his own cars. Um, his 356s that he's restored have won all the top Concours awards that you can win in Australia. Um, uh, when you need something uh, done on an historical car in Australia uh, you probably call Ron to do the job, particularly if you want it done right uh, the first time. Ron likes to surround himself with uh, good people. Um, and uh, the really nice thing about Ron is that um, creates an atmosphere that you want to give as much as uh, he gives. And I think that's really important is that uh, Ron's old school, uh, old values, a lot of that's missing these days. And uh, you know I've got my son here today with me, he's uh, 21, and I couldn't think of uh, a better role model for my boy uh, than to hang around with uh, people like uh, Ron Goodman and uh, Vic and Barbara Skirmitz and the people that are associated with this motorsport at this level. I first got involved in motorsport since I was a kid. Uh, first, my first car was a HG Monaro, uh, which I took to uh, Liverpool Speedway and started racing it there. That was a long, long time ago now. Yeah. From Liverpool Speedway, it uh, opened the doors for NASCAR. NASCAR to me was an absolute pinnacle of motorsport from my speedway days. I suppose when I look at the initial introduction to Ron Goodman, um, it was at Calder Park at the uh, famous Bob Jane uh, Thunderdome and, uh, and Ron had just sort of entered into NASCAR racing. It would have been in the early 90s to mid 90s um, and that's when uh, the track was on fire, literally. And uh, speaking of on fire, 
Ronnie Goodman knows how to have a barbecue in a NASCAR. He really, uh, really likes the wick at both ends. My only memorable, really memorable moment of NASCAR, and I suppose my only claim to fame in NASCAR, was the big crash that we had. Um, it was only, it was probably our best race that we were doing. We were running third. There was 20 odd laps to go. Um, we had a full tank of fuel. The cars in front didn't. Coming into uh, turn three, we got tagged in the rear and hit the wall at 180 mile an hour, and it was then a ping, ping pong ball from top to bottom. So. Made a mess of the car. Ron Goodman's car is on fire. He's getting out. Yeah, I got out pretty good. A couple of burns and a few lost a few body parts later on, but other than that, we got out pretty good. So I wouldn't say I went into racing retirement. I just um, NASCAR faded away in Australia. Um, there was just nothing there that interested me. I couldn't afford to go V8 racing or anything like that. That was just out of my budget. Uh, and then. Um, Along come the historic racing. We got more and more involved in that, and it's absolutely the best thing that we've done. There's not many people who can hang the tail on a 356 and get away with it. Yet I've seen, when I've been doing commentary at Wakefield Park and Eastern Creek, I've seen Ron hang the tail of a 356 and get, get away with it time and time again. Not that many people can do that. He demands a lot of respect from the Americans. They know that he's coming. They, they know he's, he's a very competent and uh, successful racer. And, you know, the, the competition is fierce, you know, and uh, he's up there with the best of them. Well, I've watched Ron race his 356 a number of times and he just drives the pants off it. You can see that he's just driving it so much harder than anyone else. He's got incredible enthusiasm, he's got incredible ability and he knows what it takes to win. And I think that's the big thing, they're the three ingredients that it takes. You've got to back yourself, you've got to believe you're a winner and I know that Ron Goodman's a winner. Ron's very passionate uh, in um, racing in general, it's not just the 356s. He's, Ron's done a lot of racing uh, throughout his life and uh, he's very passionate about racing in general. Ron pushes his 356s beyond what anybody would believe could be done. He, he really is an extremely skillful driver um, his background in Speedway helps with that. I remember being with him in Lapland for the Porsche Ice Driving. And he was an absolute star there because he, he could drive a car sideways around a complete track, never ever pointing anywhere near the direction of the track. And that was really the way you do it and the instructors uh, at this uh, course were, just couldn't believe how, how good his car control was. Ron's first visit to Laguna Seca was in the, uh, in the grey car <clears throat> and its suspension hadn't been set up at all properly, so the car, for most people, would be undrivable. It was sideways everywhere. And that absolutely suited his driving style because he was extremely spectacular. In fact, that's why the organisers wanted him back, because he was spectacular, but he didn't go off. Well, not a lot, anyway. Well, the day he told us he was going back to Monterey, I didn't believe him, because we thought, we all thought he'd fluked it, he'd talked his way in, and it was just a fluke. It was a miracle that he'd done it. We told him, you're not going to get in another time, mate. You had your one shot, that was it. And of course, Ron being Ron, he just turned around and said, you watch me. And I think probably that was one of the reasons he was so determined to go there and so determined to do even more than he'd done the last time. But we didn't believe he'd do it for one second. 
Well, originally when I uh, said to Dave and Jeff about getting my car accepted for Monterey, they thought it was a joke. They said, you wouldn't have a hope in hell that you're wasting your time. I proved them wrong. This is now another year that we're going and we're going to keep going. So. But we never believe he's going to get in because everyone in the world wants to race their cars at Monterey and Ron's got these funny little three, five, sixes, you know, and somehow he gets them on the agenda and over he goes. If Ron can go to Monterey and perform well in that kind of company, it's a feeling, it's an affirmation to him that he is capable of mixing it with the best. Not just in terms of his own driving, because he's very quick, but also in terms of his car preparation. I think he wants to go to an event like Monterey and say, here in Australia, we can produce a Porsche 356. It is as good as anyone else in the world can put together. One of our biggest hurdles that we're going to have to jump is making sure logistically that the car arrives there this time. Uh, after the last episode, um, we're changing our shippers this year. So hopefully the car will be there well within time. So it'll give us time to get the car prepared for the race. The trouble he had last time, he's, he's forgotten about that. And he'll probably have troubles the next time he goes, but again, uh, he'll, he'll override that with his desire to win, to do better than he did last time, to do a better job in the pits, to set a new lap record, uh, to try and lap the whole field twice if he can. Uh, that'll all override any difficulties that he might have had. And, and that's the beauty of Ron. He'll, he'll have all this drama and all of these problems and within a very short period of time, they'll be gone. And the competition will override that the desire to be the best and the desire to have a lot of fun because he does have a lot of fun when he does these things. Today we're having a look at Ron Goodman's 356 Porsche. We're going to be doing a series of uh, measurements on the suspension to um, get a feeling for how we can improve the car, how, how we can um, improve its performance on the track. Uh, Ron's given us some feedback on how the car um, has been behaving and uh, there are obviously a few gains that we can make. We had Dion come in, uh, the suspension guy. He gave us a heap of changes to implement on the Thursday night. Uh, so Thursday night we literally spent all night, pulled the car right apart, put it all back together again with um, Dion's suspension setup. We took it out Friday morning to the Speed Fest for testing. Uh, the first couple of laps the car wouldn't go into second gear properly. It felt down on power. And then uh, on the third lap, as we we're coming up around the back, we shifted into third gear and. It was devastating, the engine just blew up. It just went bang in a big way. Uh, I haven't been that devastated in a long time because we've only done three laps. And we've got now, we're back here on Saturday to pull the engine out and rebuild it. Because uh, we've only got two weeks before we load the car in to send it to Monterey. What else have we got there, Ray? Um, we just going to mask up these two pipes, these two oil cooler pipes. That's all. Right. Just got one more bolt there. Oh, the other bottom bolt? Yeah, right. we've got one more bolt there. Mark and Remo and myself are going to pull the main engine back out of the car. So then we start from scratch again with a new block and rebuild the whole engine. Something that takes us a couple of months, we've now got to try and get done in a few days. Oh, that's fuel going everywhere. Yeah. Well, it's going on me. That's magic. <laughs> and so we've got five days to get an engine ready, a transmission ready, go out and test it, and then we've got a further five days to do a month and a half's work to have the spare engine ready. So in case we have this problem in Laguna Seca.
That's the engine. That's the engine. Well, what's left of it anyway? We get devastated, I get down about it, but um, it's a fact. We're taking the end, these are 50 year old engines and, and we're using the horsepower of today's cars. We're building a lot of today's cars. So. We don't like to take defeat, but unfortunately you just got to take it sometimes and this is a prime example, so. You can see we're at the smack bottom of this rod as well, along the way. Yeah. Gary uh, is my engine guy. He's uh, been with me for a long time. We've got a good affinity together. Uh, he knows how I drive. Uh, he builds the engines to the way that I drive. And he's forever thinking of new ways to try and get a bit more power out of the engines. We've got Remo on the team who's um, actually one of uh, Porsche's top technicians. Remo's uh, ability to diagnose a problem and rectify it is, is uncanny. Uh, nine times out of ten, he knows the answer to the problem before I can get out of the car. Um, he's very, very knowledgeable when it comes to Porsches, especially the older Porsches, and he's an invaluable part of the team. Uh, then we've got uh, old Mark on the team. Uh, he's, uh, he does all the body work, he does anything that needs to be done on the car. He's um, really comprehensive, very fussy, uh, so he gets along good with us. Uh, I've been told that I'm a little bit fussy sometimes, but um, nothing wrong with that, I don't think. The car was absolutely fantastic. I could not have been any happier. It stopped, the car just turned in where I wanted it to. We, we, were, we were jumping out of our skin, and boy, did it have some power. It's, I can't wait. Uh, we should have got a lap time, but unfortunately I didn't want to get one just in case something went wrong, so we're happy with the car, more than happy with the car. I made an absolute huge error. I um, came a little bit too fast into a corner and the car just didn't want to turn in. I think my uh, ambitions far outweighed my ability. Uh, I just come in too hot, the car looped and we hit the wall. When I hit that wall, it felt so slow, so I've been in accidents before, but this one was bad. Not only was I wrecking an absolute pristine car, but we only had a couple of days for it to be loaded into the container. So we literally uh, worked around the clock for two and a half days straight to get the car repaired. Uh, here it is, 2 a.m. Monday morning. Uh, we finally just finished the car. Um, 48 hours of non-stop after um, I made the mistake testing it and went a little bit too quick and we hit something pretty hard in the front. Um, now we think we've got it right and I'm off to Indianapolis today for the historic races out there and it'll be up to the boys to load the car into the container and hopefully it'll be right for Monterey and all our bad luck's behind us. Um, we thought last year was bad luck but this is a lot worse this year so hopefully it'll be right. very, very slow car, I want you down low, okay? If you're out there and you're just touring around, that's all well and good, and I'm an Indian, you're looking at everything out there just to suck in the experience. That's all well and good, but we want you down on the low line, okay? Moderate speeds in the middle, and if, you're, if you want to run pretty good, on the outside, okay? So, low... The thing that I've discovered most about uh, racing on the West Coast is that uh, the guys there are a lot more 
gentlemanly than here. Um, I've a few times been said that I'm a little bit aggressive. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking far out. If they want to say aggressive, they should come home and race with the guys over there. You know? And there is huge speed diversity out there. So totally heads up. We got midgets out with roadsters. We've got, you know, there's a, there's a great breadth of cars. Everybody deserves to be out on that oval. So be very, very aware. When you take it in hindsight, you know, like as I said before, we're racing against $38 million cars, $40 million cars, $20 million cars, and here we are with our little fella out there, so it's a good feather in our cap. down with this flu this morning and literally changing the tyres this morning to a new set. It was just a struggle to lift the tyres, but hey, once that helmet goes on, everything changes, I suppose. So. The problem for Ron was that when he arrived at Indianapolis, he was arriving at a track that was new to him and he had to learn a new circuit. Now, some of the circuit is just like a road circuit that we're familiar with other parts of it, there is absolutely nothing but concrete walls to hit if you make the slightest mistake. Now that's one thing on a nice fine day, but when he got to Indianapolis, the weather was anything but kind to him. On top of that, he had the flu. So he had jet lag, he had the flu, he had an unfamiliar track, and he had wet weather. It was a pretty dynamic mixture. You can see it's wet, very, very wet, uh, which we're going to enjoy, but I haven't got any uh, wet weather tyres, so we're going to go out on the speedsters just to learn the track a bit and keep us a bit slower too. He has this strange idea that he doesn't want to look at a track beforehand. He doesn't look at in-car video. He doesn't look at maps of the track to work out corner speeds. He seems to have the idea that he just goes out and if the track goes left, he goes left. If the track goes right, he goes right. So he does remarkably well, given that lack of knowledge when he jumps in the car for the first time. I still think if he was really a scholar rather than a goer, he might actually be even quicker than he is. The car seems good. We went over it last night when we got here yesterday. Uh, everything on the car seems right, but once again, being a wet track, we don't know how it's going to go. So. really shouldn't have been out there. I, I, I couldn't see five foot in front of me. The flu was absolutely killing me. But there was no way in the world I was not going to go out there to get a couple of laps under my belt. We'd done three laps and I just had to pull it in. I, I was going to crash the car again. And you've got to remember too, I still had in my mind the other car I'd wrecked back in Australia. So I'd come straight from wrecking one car into a um, potential another crash. Okay. How are you feeling, mate? Oh, a lot better today. You know, yesterday I was really buggered. I, I just couldn't handle it anymore. After three laps, we had to pull in. I was the flu had just taken hold. And coming into the corners, we still set the fastest lap yesterday. 
Yeah. So I thought three laps come in and I went straight back and slept in the in the back of the truck. When that's enough, I didn't want to crash the car, so I just brought it in yesterday. But as I said, we got the fastest lap time yesterday, so hopefully today we'll go a bit better and in qualifying we should do better. think back, my days have been Speedway oval track racing. So it's just put your foot down, hold the car on 8200 revs and just go past everybody. And that's what we were doing, it was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And when you looked at the times, we were like 20 seconds or faster than most of the other cars out there. So we were, we were pretty happy with the way we were. One of the great things about historic racing everywhere in the world is the camaraderie in the pits. It's the drivers get together at the end of a, of a race where they've all been giving each other curry and then after it's all over they can basically settle down and have a laugh and say and, and, and retell the race in their, from their own perspective. We paid to rent the track. Let's pay, that's part of the track. That's why next time we're to get around you, did you say I went down there? Sometimes you'd think if there were 30 cars in the race, there were 30 winners from the way the guys are carrying on. I just couldn't believe it. I, the, I, I literally nearly had tears coming out of my eyes. I thought, I've got him boxed in here, beauty, and then you just went, bloop, I'm a bastard. What do I have to do? Ron, Ron's a very disarming character. Uh, he, he, his passion in the car is second to none. I've not seen anyone that gets into a car with the passion and determination to win that he has. No, out of them, we should be on the first row, you and me. First two rows, yeah. But then he's got this other side of him, his personality. He's like a little kid, you know, and, and you can't help but love him, you know, and you want to give him a big cuddle. So some of these guys probably hate the way he beats them, but then he gets out of the car and He's running over to them, shaking their hand. The best thing that's ever happened to me is racing with you. And he disarms them. In the morning, it was fantastic. Couldn't wait to get out there. Uh, at the driver's briefing, I had a bit of um, apprehension because they were saying that you wouldn't be able to overtake through the corners. And I thought, if we can't overtake through the corners and you've got to slow down, it's going to create havoc and it's going to create accidents. Then at the driver's meeting, they said, yes, slow cars to the low lane. Uh, medium speed cars to the middle lane and the faster cars to the outside and that you could overtake with care. We literally get out there and you get up to fourth gear, top gear, and then you build the car up to speed up to 8,500 RPM, and then you just hold it there. 
Literally you roll out of it about 200 RPM into the corners and let the G-forces hold you into the corner and then you flat out again. So you're doing an average of 8200 RPM around the whole track. The car felt great, like a nice and comfortable in it. Uh, every time that you'd go past the cover, you'd get a bit of the buffeting from the other car, so the car would become loose in the corner. So you just have to be wary of that, that you knew that the rear end was going to be sliding a bit, about 160 mile an hour. There's a tire mark on his freaking car where his tire went up over the over yeah, the body work. That's it. The boy's lucky he didn't lose his head. He's a, uh, they told me he's okay. Yeah, he's fine. It's just anything that happens here, they have to go. Well, this was what he was worried about all along. Why he wasn't going to go out. Don't worry about it, slow that fucking back. Okay. Car's fucked. Oh, yeah. He passed us. Both of us. I have the green bug eye, he has the yeah. Elva. You came high, you know, you were high up here, gave you point by, stayed where we should stay. You were coming by just fine. So, you were driving. You were driving great, and, and we were trying to stay where we needed to stay. We come and look at your car, we see the tire mark. And the front and here, where you... that little fall over the wheel. He drove straight, and, and, and it looks like he wasn't even supposed to be out there. Today was a fantastic opportunity. The car was um, uh, all prepared to go on to, to actually race the Oval at Indy. Um, we took it out there and it was absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, the first lap was just over the moon. We, we, I absolutely loved the, the first lap. It was something that not many people get to experience, especially in a little 356. We're a part of history today, as they all said. Unfortunately, a car that shouldn't have been out there, an open wheeler, uh, moved in front of us and sent us into the air and into the wall. And as you can see in the video, my, oh, I'm pretty happy with my instincts. Um, from NASCAR before, they talk when you hit the wall, you keep steering into the wall. And if you look on the video, I just keep turning into the wall. And, uh, I had no steering on the actual car, but I still just kept turning it into the wall. You're out there, especially on oval track racing. Um, it's high speed, and crashes happen. And unfortunately, there's not usually any light crashes on oval track, and this is proof in the pudding. You know? I got back from Indy, 
and um, we were thinking the car should be getting close to America now. So we got on to the people and um, they were very, very evasive with the answers which we'd become used to the year before. And then we found out that the car was two days out of New Zealand. Now after a bit of an explosion, we're thinking like two days out of New Zealand, that means it's only been gone three days and you've had the thing for nearly a month and a half, two months. I think when the car didn't turn up on time, the first I knew of it was David Withers called me and said, Ron's got a drama, his car's not there. And then within seconds, Ron was on the phone and you, all you can do is listen because he's so angry and furious and that people can't do their jobs properly. And uh, it's gonna, he's not going to get there and he's done all this work and preparation. Getting the car accepted was an incredible feat. Getting the car there is another feat and then making sure that Ron himself goes. Because sometimes things can happen and he'll say, right, that's it, I'm not going. And everyone's prepared to go. But he says, no, we're not going. And everyone sort of goes, wow. Uh, but so getting him there is the final piece of the puzzle after all of those other dramas. We've got a, we've got a car stuck in New Zealand. An acquaintance last night who's um, helped me out immensely. The car has been broken down out of the container with all the tools and all the equipment. Uh, it's going onto a passenger jet on Saturday morning. Uh, the little car's going to have more frequent flyer points than some of my guys on the team. So, all in all, it's all coming together. Now, in saying that, there's still only one stumbling block, and that's the American Customs. Now, if the American Customs decide to create us a drama, <laughs> we're still dead in the water. We might as well still be in New Zealand instead of in America. So at least the good thing is that we're, the car is going to be in America and we've got more chance of being at the race now. Monterey is undoubtedly the historic race meeting in America. That's the one that everybody wants to get to. It's the one that people travel to from all over the world. It's the, uh, it's the place that you want to be. It's part of Monterey Car Week. Now, Monterey Car Week consists of auctions, a Concorde d'Elegance or five, all sorts of social events, but for me, what Monterey is all about is the historic racing, and for any historic racing aficionado, that's the place to be at Monterey's Car Week. <laughs> Friday we've got here, um, the container's here, the fuel's here, but we haven't got any car here yet. Um, Gary's actually chasing them up now to see if he can get um, some sort of joy to get the car released from, from the EPA. Uh, we saw them in, in race control, they're ready to help us with whatever we need. They've also told us that there's another one stuck in Canada, so we're not the only one that's getting um, jerked around with all the EPA people, but um, hey, we'll see how it goes today. Ron's a pretty laid-back kind of guy. But I have to tell you that on the day before that race meeting, he was looking a little bit more stressed than I've ever seen him look before. Uh, he was, I think at that stage, uh, wishing he'd pulled the pin about a month earlier. It was really, really touch and go. Can you imagine what it must have been like for him? You know, they were 
They were standing around the pits. The car's supposed to be all tuned and highly ready to go. And of course, the thing's just absent. The thing just wasn't there. So maybe if you get onto them and just ask them if they can, um, if we can pick up the, all the spares, if that's been... He was due out the next morning at seven o'clock. 5.30, a truck finally rolled into Laguna Seca. Ron, Ron. Oh, fantastic. And on the back of that truck was Ron's 356 and a whole lot of boxes. At least there's not damage this time, Andrew. I've never seen a look on, of relief on Ron's face, quite like the look on his face when they finally got the car off. Then they had to change the oil, uh, reset the suspension, do a whole stack of work on the car before the very next morning when it was due out on the Watch circuit. Yourself, Absolutely fucking wrapped, it's finally here now. It's um, 5.30, so we're ahead, we're ahead. We'll get it off, get it up to scrutineering now so that at least we can go straight out tomorrow. He was here last year and he tore it up, so glad he made it back. Very nice guy. So we're lucky for you guys to be here. So. The irony is, in retrospect, if you organise the container, you pack the container here, it goes on a ship, someone picks it up in San Francisco and drops it at Laguna Seca and you arrive and open the doors of your container and there there are your cars and then you think, wow, this is a miracle. There's a lot to organising it, but the irony is when you get there and you've got all your things you normally have in the pit in your container, the Americans are just shocked. And of course, Ron, again, like normal, he goes overboard and he's got the kitchen sink as well. One of the great appeals of the Monterey Historic Race Meeting is that it's held at Laguna Seca Racetrack. Laguna Seca is principally famous for a corner called the Corkscrew, or a set of corners. It is really one of the most spectacular uh, little S-bends in historic motor racing or in motor racing around the world. It's a little S-bend that drops down through the height of a seven-storey building in about 150 metres. It is unbelievable. first time you drive over the corkscrew is, is driving like Eau Rouge in, in um, Spa in Belgium or any of the other famous corners. It's just what you've got to do once in your lifetime and if you can do it two or three or four times then you think you've made it. Monterey, for me and most other people in the world in historic racing, is one of the top two places you want to take your car, uh, to display it, um, to race it, and it's where anyone who has a, a passion for historic race cars wants to be. It's a uh, motor race where you just can't rock up. You, you've got to be invited. Uh, you've got to have a car that meets the very strict criteria. Um, we were lucky, we were fortunate uh, to have an early girl like our one and, and that they wanted it. I 
love this car. You know, these guys have a great presentation and, and this Porsche Speedster is one of the most beautiful cars here at the track today. Hello, hey, man. What's up with you, guy? Got nothing better to do. Nah, nah. <laughs> How are you, Ron? Hello, hey, man. Do you mind turning the glove box on the other side? Oh, no, no problem at all. Last time I sat in an Australian race car, it was a baffle. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want there, Brian Redmond signed it. So well, oh, shit, he took the whole thing up. You yeah. tell him it was a small car. <laughs> this is awesome! I've never been in a race car before. It's great. I think I can do this. Home it on to. <laughs> this is fabulous. I love it. It's fantastic. I think it suits me. is the baddest outlaw that I've ever seen. I like it. Well, this is spectacular. I love it. My favorite car at the show. What do I like about it? Oh, the color to begin with. Uh -huh. The fact that it's a 356, got the outlaw look from Australia. I don't know if you're uh familiar with uh, oh, yeah, I've heard about them. the little the little <laughs> outlaw badge. Hard. <laughs> hard to get hold of. Extremely hard. So as a gift from my dad and myself, we want to you know give you a little three for six outlaw badge and we just you know love what you do buddy. No, I appreciate that very much. Really, really you know I always uh, tell people you know if you want to see some great cars from down under take a look at what Ron and his guys are doing in Australia because um, I really have always felt that, that the way he builds them, the little details, the little touches you know, he really gets it. He doesn't just get the racing side, but he gets the true spirit of 356 Outlaws and what these little Porsches are all about. You know, historic racing, there's a mantra which says, as it was, so it shall be. Now that is usually used to apply to the cars themselves. But I have a feeling that at Monterey, as it was, so it shall be, equally applies to the attitude to racing, to the attitude of the competitors to each other, and the attitude of the competitors to the public who go and have a look at it. They have a wonderful attitude at Monterey, which I think is quite unique. We were planning on going out in Group 5B, which is what we raced in last year. On the day of scrutineering, they scrutineered us and we got our sticker for Group 3A, which is like the $35 million cars, like a lot dearer than our car, a lot faster than our cars, so we thought. But all the guys that you race against over there are absolutely fantastic. You know, they, they appreciate their cars as much as we do, uh, if not more, some of them. Um, but mate, racing against the guys there, there's no, um, I'm better than you or you're better than me, they're all, they're, they're more than helpful. I think Monterey represents the holy grail to car enthusiasts and it doesn't matter which mark you follow or you love, uh, they're there and they're incredibly well maintained, they're presented better than they were when they were rolling out of their factories whatever year they were made and it's you just go there and for four days, you just can't get enough. Well, I think Ron derives an enormous amount of satisfaction from taking a car to an event like this and proving that he can actually come up with the goods you know, on this world stage. You know, he's got a car which some Americans believe is the fastest 356 Porsche in the world. The car is faster than cars which really should leave it in their way. And that's a combination of two things, of course, it's Ron and it's the car. It's Ron's uh, obsession with getting everything just right. On one of the auctions there, they had a Ferrari 250 GTO. It went under the hammer. It sold for $38 million. The same car we were racing against in the race, 
and it finished just behind us in the main race. Uh, the joke with me and the guys was that uh, if I was to actually crash into that car, whether I was in the right or the wrong, I'd be in the wrong. It was just unbelievable to race against a car of that calibre and beat it. One of the guys sent me a video of an old song called Roller Coaster, and that's what it's been now. Yeah, just up and down, so it's really good. Now it's really good. It hasn't been good, but now it's really good. Yeah. We're on top of that roller coaster, and hopefully it's just going to flatten out there. Looking at the competition, I think we're going to do pretty good. We should win some over the weekend, so we'll see how we go. All the bad luck's behind us, so we've got to win some. Yeah, like... It's my honor to present the next award, which is very, it's very dear to my heart. Best paddock display. The people that fill the hillsides and the bleachers and come down in the paddock to see your wonderful cars, they don't know who Mike Silverman or Bill Warner or Kenny Epsman or Murray Smith are. But they know of Dan Gurney and George Fulmer and Parnelly Jones and Mark Donahue and all the great drivers back in the day. And the only way that they can link those names to your cars is from the paddock displays. So it's a great pleasure to present the award for best paddock display representative of their era to Ron Goodman. Yeah. The fact that he's a Nazi, we both hold the